Welcome to part six of Expansion and Empire. We're now going to take a look at part one of a two-part series on Indian removal. Perhaps nothing more epitomizes the contradictions of American build, uh, building the Continental Empire than the forcible removal of uh, the Native Americans from their ancestral lands, including 125,000 just from what is now the south, Southeast United States. Now, there's a lot of different examples that we can look at on that, but I'm going to go ahead and just take a look at the Cherokee because this is one we can take a very detailed look at. Uh, and, you know, because their reaction to this is actually pretty is, is robust as the effort to remove them. Right. Uh, between June of 1838 and March of uh, 1839, the federal government is going to remove the Cherokee Indians from their uh, from their lands there in Georgia and North Carolina, Alabama and Tennessee. Right. The Cherokee are going to call this exodus the trail where they cry. Today we refer to it as the Trail of Tears. Right. 16,000 refugees are going to make the exodus, and at least one quarter of them are going to die in the, in the process, right? Now, at the time of first European contact, the Cherokee Nation was approximately, you know, they didn't have defined borders, but they uh, was approximately 140,000 square miles, right? Uh, pretty much took up the heartland of the Great Smoky Mountains. OK, the Cherokee themselves had obviously uh, immigrated to these regions. They were an Iroquoian, uh, Iro Iroquoian people because of the language they spoke. And they referred themselves as uh, uh, the Anyuina, right? The Anyuina means principal people, right? The Cherokee Nation itself was broken into seven matrilineal clans, wolf, deer, bird, paint, long hair, wild potato, and blue. And these clans were important because they formed kinship uh, uh, identities for each of the groups and, uh, and created the social balance of society, right? Um, it did make them uh, immune from uh, conflict with the Europeans, though. During the Revolutionary War, for example, the Cherokees are going to side with the British, with the Crown. They felt that the colonists were acting the same as uh, a child to its parent and that the parent was going to come in and set them straight. So needless to say, the British laws had a profound effect on them, which resulted in a series of uh, treaties and land concessions, which uh, equated to losing about 20,000 square miles of their land. All right. By the end of the 1790s, you're going to see the Cherokee land continually get retracted until finally it reaches an area where it's pr primarily in northern Georgia. So Georgia will be the primary uh, um, uh, state that's going to be uh, leading the effort to try and remove the Cherokees from the region entirely. Now, with American independence, most Native American groups, of course, saw this with a little bit of trepidation, right? Uh, Thomas Jefferson, actually, as president, is going to initialize something called the Civilization Program, which is a part of what he referred to as expansion with honor. Now, the civilization program called for uh, assimilation of the Native Americans into uh, American society. So they could, they, the Cherokee had reasons to be cautiously uh, uh, optimistic, but cautious is a key word here. Thomas Jefferson had also referred to the Native Americans in the Declaration of Independence and called them merciless Indian savages, right? During the Revolutionary War itself, Thomas Jefferson had actually called for a military command, uh, campaign against the Suwannee Indians, uh, nomadic Indians there on the east side of the, uh, of the Mississippi River to try and push them out of, uh, uh, of the region. Ultimately, land is going to be the issue. And in the south, where the Cherokee are, the land that they're sitting on is going to be cotton land, land that's perfect for farming cotton. Cotton is going to become king in the south after the 17, in the 1790s. And so this civilization mission is going to become one of attempting to try and relocate and free up this cotton farming land held by the Native American nations. Now, again, President Thomas Jefferson is going to kind of lead what's eventually going to be uh, Indian removal of, of the Cherokees from Georgia, right? Uh, Georgia is going to want the Cherokees out of their region. But you also remember when the Treaty of Paris had granted all that land 
uh, to the Mississippi River, uh, Georgia had basically extended its border that far. So in 1803, Thomas Jefferson signs with Georgia what's called the Georgia Compact, right? The president in the, uh, signs the, the compact with the state, right? The Georgia Compact agreed to pay Georgia $1.2 million to relinquish, relinquish its land claims on what is now Mississippi and Alabama. And um, in, in exchange for that, the federal government is also going to agree to remove the Native Americans on what is says, quote, peaceable and reasonable terms. In other words, we will remove the Cherokee for you. This is 1803, okay? By 1820, Jefferson's now well out of office. By 1820, nothing had been done, right? So in what becomes finally known as part of the Marshall Trilogy on Indian Removal, a Supreme Court case that will pass in 1823 will be used as justification for Georgia to begin to take things into their own hands. In 1823, a Supreme Court case called Johnson versus McIntosh uh, is going to state that uh, uh, that a territory has the doctrine of discovery. In other words, the discovering nation has absolute underlying authority over discovered lands. Right now, you can make the argument, oh well, then the Cherokee have the doctrine of discovery over their lands. That's not what this is referring to. It's talking about uh, the initial European powers and now the United States, right? <clears throat> okay, so so being the discovered land, the indigenous people are actually tenants and only hold occupancy rights. Okay, that's the reference to the Native Americans. So Georgia takes a look at this Supreme Court decision and in 1828 decides to take it one step further. Their argument is simply this. Britain established the doctrine of discovery as the discovering nation when it founded the settlement of Georgia. When Georgia became an independent nation, they inherited that doctrine of discovery, right? And they did not relinquish that doctrine of discovery when they became part of the United States. So in 1828, they're gonna pass a law which extends all civil and criminal jurisdiction in the state of Georgia on into Cherokee land, right? This was in order to uh, begin working on pressing the Cherokees out of the region. Now, the result of this is going to be a legal battle. The Cherokee, who are rather cosmopolitan, are going to fight back using the legal system that's in place. 